a majority of us, the road to financial freedom is littered with speed bumps and lots of fear. But don't despair. You're not alone. A recent uh, survey of most Americans indicates that we all kind of suffer the top four stressors. Lack of money, too much debt, rising health care costs, a pension crisis, so much more. We're going to take a look at your financial fitness coming up on Outlook. Stay with us. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you joined us. You know, a recent Gallup poll of Americans found that nearly 14% of us rank low wages, too much debt, and concerns over health care costs and saving for retirement or college as the top stressors when it comes to money. Well, on the program today, we're going to take a look and find out about your financial fitness, your personal financial fitness, and we're going to find out a little bit more about the looming pension crisis in the state of Kentucky as we welcome two individuals in the know. Welcome, please, if you will, Dr. Indudeep Chachi. He joins us. He has a doctorate in finance and uh, also teaches finance here at WKU. And in July, he'll return to head of that department. He's done lots of scholarly research published in some of the top finance journals. And since 07, Dr. Chachi's been consulting with Argy Financial Group. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara. Us. So good to be here. Appreciate that. In addition, Jeannie Fisher joins us. She is a certified financial planner. She has an MBA, serves as a 401k and retirement specialist for Argy. She is one of 50 CFP board ambassadors and the only one in Kentucky. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. In that role, her mission is to educate the public on the importance of having a personal financial plan. And incidentally, both of our guests on today's program are currently serving on the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce's Pension Reform Task Force. We'll get into that a little bit later. But before we get started, you know, that is your mission as an ambassador, and congratulations on that designation. Thank you. You know, people need to have a personal financial plan. In your experience, both <laughs> of you, is that the exception rather than the rule? Yes, I mean, I, I, I believe so. It's certainly the exception to have a written plan that you're following. I think everybody has dreams, uh, but to actually put pen to paper and follow that jointly as a, as a spouse is, is rare. That's exactly what we find because, you know, most people talk about these things, but when it comes down to actually writing something down, that's a very rare event. So even, um, but is that the first step, like in a 10-step program, I guess, or 12-step <laughs> program where you suddenly, you talk about it, at least getting the conversation going, isn't that a good way to open the door? It's definitely the first step. Uh, and it's one we find that people don't often have until they're sitting down across from a planner like us and they have somebody to mediate that conversation. It's interesting the conversation that comes out between husband and wife saying, why, I didn't realize that was something you wanted to do. Okay. Many a times the first meetings are more like a meeting with a psychiatrist because <laughs> you're finding out different things that you know maybe uh -huh. husband and wife have not talked with each other about and that's always revealing to us as well as to them. And you really have to listen, don't you? You absolutely have and to. And to the nuances and to see how, so yeah, you are like a psychologist in, right. a, in a lot of ways. So getting the discussion going, opening the discussion, but your experience tells us that most people wait till it's too late? Definitely until it's harder. Uh, if you wait until, yeah, I, I would say it's never too late because okay. any steps you take are helpful, uh, but most people, it, it doesn't become real to them. Retirement remains a mythical thing until you reach your 50s, and then at that point, it is much more difficult to get caught up. We talked a little bit about, you know, so you talk about the different clients that you have, but people save money in very different ways. I used to work at a bank, just the way people would come to the teller window or open a new account. They all had their own little unique way of dealing with money. Do we see inequities in gender and also with certain cohorts? You know, millennials maybe save differently than depression era babies. Talk a little bit about that. So there's actually a lot of evidence about differences between how women deal with money and how men deal with money. So for example, and, and women are not going to like hearing this, but <laughs> when it comes to financial literacy, um, the recent poll, a recent poll found that women are probably a little bit more financially illiterate than men, but that's where the bad news for women ends. Actually, the women are less overconfident as compared to men, so women are more willing to be educated and seek help. 
Men, on the other hand, tend to have a little bit more overconfidence, which again holds them back in terms of the eventual performance of their investment portfolios. Interesting. And you focus a lot on women in your practice. We do. Well, it's an easier conversation. It's almost like there's a natural trust and empathy. What's interesting about women is uh, financial planning and wellness, it's all tied to security. You know, and, and they view everything through a family lens. How does this serve my family? How does this serve my children? So it's a different long-term conversation. Men tend to be a little bit more focused on the value of money, the account balance, the short-term gains. Uh, so you kind of have to speak to your audience uh, to, to get them engaged in the process. So talk to me about millennials. You know, we hear so <laughs> much about the millennials and, and now we have a um, homeland uh, cohort as well, which I understand are children that were born after 9-11. So, you know, we have this up and coming uh, generation. How do millennials save? Well, I think this is an interesting topic and I'll probably uh, be more pro-millennial than most. Uh, what you actually find is that this millennial cohort saves a little bit better than the Generation X did. Uh, and that's because of the recession that many of us came into. When we graduated back in 08, 09, we were stepping into an environment where we weren't finding jobs and then the generation ahead of us was losing their jobs. So while there is this stigma that maybe millennials aren't doing what they should be doing, relative to past generations at that age, uh, they're actually doing better. The greatest generation, okay? <laughs> we know what we're talking about there. You know, uh, for those that are facing that era in their lives, that in some cases final chapter, have they prepared adequately? In some cases they are, but in, in many cases they are not. And the reason is that the financial landscape has changed. For example, the retirement world is completely different today than it was 20, 30 years ago. Many of these greatest generation people grew up in, in the world where there were defined benefit plans, also known as pension plans. And, and in those cases, they really didn't have to worry about financial security. You, were, you went to work at a company and, and you retired in 30 years and you, you got your watch and you came back <laughs> home and, and you picked up your pension paycheck for the rest of your life. Well, that's all gone. And if it's not all gone, it's about to go. Um, so I think that's a, that's a little bit of a different dynamic that they had to navigate, which millennials know there are no pensions, and that's going to be you know, a different way of dealing with this. The millennials know that. The Gen Xers? They're actually the generation that's in the most pain right now uh, because they haven't kind of, it's not become mainstream conversation per se. The millennials know they're responsible. They know they have to take ownership in this retirement picture. And Gen Xers were a little caught by surprise. They didn't have the generation ahead of them saying, it's now up to you. Pay attention, it's exactly. coming. Exactly. So, you know, if you're watching this program and you heard it here, really, those days are gone. Right. Yeah. The days of, uh, you know, putting in 30 years, getting the gold watch, and right. receiving a pension for the rest of your life. I think, to Jeannie's point, no one has really driven the urgency. That's the problem. You know, uh, there are only 17 states in the country which require the high, schools, uh, high school students to get any exposure to personal finance, and Kentucky is not one of them. So kids growing up, they're not hearing this in school, they're not hearing this in college, um, they're not hearing this at the dinner table at home. And that's what has to change for, for us to have a society where everyone is taking responsibility for their own financial security. That's a really good point. Now, Jeannie, you do something in your line of work and it's called a financial fitness quiz. You don't have to exercise, but you say there is a correlation between health and finances. We're about to go to a break, but let's go ahead, Karen, and put up that financial fitness quiz. And in your opinion, after you watch people take this quiz mm -hmm. and look at the answers, do you find a lot of shock? No. It, it's, it's easy to see, and the financial fitness quiz is, is pretty basic and it's pretty easy to follow, but it's all about how aware you are and how prepared you are. And if you don't answer that well, it, it's going to be obvious that you're not a financially fit household. Aware, prepare, and you say that does have a correlation to your, your physical health as it well? It does. So this is interesting. Susie Orman made it a habit of predicting the winner of The Biggest Loser based on their credit score. Because at the root of health and at the root of finance is discipline right? The discipline not to purchase something else or not to eat something else. And so it, it's all about that personal accountability and, and there's a direct link. I love that. We're going to talk some more about that and we're going to find out the latest on the Kentucky pension crisis, plus more on the Kentucky Acoustic Music Festival later in the half hour. Stay with us. Outlook continues. 
Outlook continues. I'm Barbara Deeb. We are on the topic of finances. How fiscally fit are you? You know, and uh, we're welcomed back to the program by Jeannie Fisher, who's a CFP, a certified financial planner with Argy. In addition, we have Dr. Indudeep Chachi, who is with WKU's finance department. And if we went into both of their biographies, we'd be here for another hour. But thank you so much. <laughs> In the first half of the show, and right before the break, you were talking about your physical fitness and your fiscal fitness and how there's a correlation because at at the core is discipline. Yes. So to be financially sound, you need to be disciplined? Yes. And that goes back to some of the financial challenges that most of America faces today. The idea that we're spending too much, not just what we have, but more than what we have. And we're not saving too much, all of, or not saving enough. All of those decisions are personal decisions that you have to be responsible for. Go ahead. Really, it's all about self-control. And Paul Solomon of the PBS News Hour actually has a very interesting report where he, along with his friends, are. Um, Cookie Monster and Elmo, <laughs> he talks about self-control, that really it's about don't buy something till you have saved for it. And that's our biggest problem. A and there's a very interesting marshmallow test where you can predict with a three-year-old child based on whether the child is gonna wait for the marshmallow or is willing to, or, or is not willing to wait, you can predict how well they're gonna do when they grow up. So it's really about self-control. Self-control and discipline, those mm, sometimes not so happy <laughs> words, but you can, and I think you alluded to this a little bit earlier in the first segment, it's never too late. You know, you might look and go, oh, I'm at the place where I can never make up the, the lost steam, but you're saying now's a good time as any. Absolutely. It's easier to start younger. It's easier to instill the habit. Uh, because once you get into your daily life and you get used to what you're, you're living in and your income and your expenses, you have to make a change. You, at that point, have to give up something today in order to save for tomorrow. But uh, you can do it, and there's several ways that you can do that. It's just a matter of committing to it. Now, we talked about the fact that you know, you're know you a certified financial planner. You work with Argy as well, and uh, Argy Financial Services. So if you're out there and you're thinking, okay, she says, they say, it's not too late, <laughs> I can get started on this, what do you look for in a financial planner, and do you need to have a financial planner? I think we would both argue you probably <laughs> do need a financial planner. I mean, no matter, <laughs> do you have to have a certain income? No, I, and that's really not the case. I think that's how financial planning is changing so much. It, it no longer requires a certain income. That's why we have flat fee planners out there. Uh, they become the mediator between you and your spouse, and they help control the conversation and really focus it. Uh, a planner's job is not to tell you what to do. Uh, they're there to guide the conversation and give you options and opportunities that you decide that you want to commit to. And that's something where uh, a person would pay a commission to you or a percentage? Uh, is that how that works? So there are different models of compensation, and that's one of the questions you have to ask. When you're looking for a financial planner, the first, one of the first questions you have to ask is, how do you get paid? There needs to be transparency in the relationship. The other question you have to ask is, what are your qualifications? Pretty much anyone can say they are a financial planner mm -hmm. or a financial advisor. There is, that piece is not really regulated. And in that sense, as, an, as a consumer, you need to be informed consumer and you need to ask that question. But one more thing I would like to add, before you get a financial planner, you need to have some degree of financial awareness, some basic idea of how much money you're making, what are you spending it on. You may not know that you're spending 15.6% on, on, <laughs> on, on eating out, but you right. need to have some idea. Is it 10%, is it 25%, what is that number? That's really good advice. And, you know, we also talked about the fact that uh, you have to be able to talk to that person that you're basically handing over your financial situation to. So, you know, you've got a great personality, you're bubbly, <laughs> you've got, you know, all this going on, and very knowledgeable, extremely knowledgeable. You know, do you need to be able to have a rapport or do you, you know, I, I can just see people who cringe every time they have to go talk to their financial planner because mm -hmm. maybe they went against the grain. You know, how, how do you work that out? I think it's both. Uh, and I think that's why we really emphasize advising in teams because you can have that camaraderie but then also have that expertise. Um, I think I would put maybe a little bit more emphasis on you fitting well personality-wise and, and having good communication. Uh, an advisor, actually, a financial advisor himself, wrote an article about finding a financial advisor. He went out and looked for one, and the whole basis of the article was how important it was to him 
something he didn't realize until the other side, that he found someone who fit his personality, someone he felt comfortable in, someone he could confide in. And so I think that's the first step, really. And then, of course, making sure they have the designations, the education, the experience. Do your homework. Do your homework. Speaking of doing homework, uh, in addition to everything you do, <laughs> you've also been wearing a, a new hat this past couple of months as uh, serving on the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce's Pension Reform Task Force. Okay, if you're just joining us and you're not aware of the fact that Kentucky is in a pension crisis and some of its teachers and some of its state workers may not have that golden that golden that's pension at the end of the rainbow, that's, that's and, you correct. know, it may be gone. So as members of this task force, tell us a little bit about that and where we're at on, on all of that. Well, some fast facts on where the pension stands today. There is a $36 billion unfunded liability. Uh, for us to meet that, every man, woman, and child in the state is going to have to pay at least $8,300. So uh, to say there's a significant issue is, is definitely not an overstatement. It, it's absolutely accurate. Uh, I think the state at this point has recognized that it's a problem. I know the Kentucky Chamber is doing quite a bit to maybe uh, spread some public awareness to the issue. Uh, but I think given Governor Bevin's campaign and some of the things that he's discussed, I do think it's becoming a, a priority now. But why do you think it's important for the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce to take up this mantle? You know, because we're finally at that crisis point and somebody's got to do it? Because it's going to affect each and every person. It's not just going to affect the 350,000 active and retired employees who are in the pension system. It's going to affect each and every person in the state of Kentucky. Over the last 18 months, our debt rating has dropped. And at this point, we are the fourth worst in the country. And what that means is, exactly, and what that means is that every time we go out and issue bonds to build a school, to build bridges, to build roads, we are paying more interest today than we were paying two years ago. And that's got to change because that's going to affect each one of us. So this is the kind of thing with your expertise and your knowledge and being on that task force. Is it doable? I think it's definitely doable. Is it easy? No. And is it something that just one person can handle on their own? Absolutely not. Everybody in the state is going to have to contribute to the solution in some manner. That having been said, I, I can see you viewers cringing. Well, wait a minute, I'm not going to be able to. But as you say, there's a bigger picture. It doesn't right. just affect the 350,000 uh, employees who might receive a pension from the state of Kentucky. That's why the chamber is asking each one of us to get involved with the solution. And the solution is going to have to involve some compromise. It's not something which can, which, which, which is an easy fix. Uh, we are not in Hogwarts, and we don't have a magic. <laughs> we, we don't, we have, don't a, have a magic. Wand. We don't have a Harry Potter and a magic yes. wand. So it's going to require some compromise uh, on every front. But we have to have Frankfurt putting in more money. We have to have some degree of structural pension reform. And at the same time, investments have to be managed much more efficiently and effectively than they have been in the past. Well, just as we said earlier in the segments, uh, as far as having a personal financial plan, that it's never too late, as we discuss the, the looming pension crisis in the state of Kentucky, so we can say it's not too late? Well, it's better to do it today than it would be tomorrow. Let's put it this right. way. <laughs> it's, it's a huge problem. She said $36 billion. Just to put that in context, the total revenue that got into Kentucky last year was about $10 billion. So if we took each and every dollar that came into the state and directed it towards the pension, it would still take us three and a half years. And we obviously cannot do that. So it's a problem that needs to be addressed now. Your roles on the Kentucky Chamber's task force related to the pension crisis, is it more just advisory and then you're, you're taking the message and informing the public? Is that? To a certain degree, I think it's about asking the right questions. Uh, so the governor has called for a third party audit and we certainly would like for that transparency uh, to be there. And we're just there to ask the questions. What are we looking for? What are some possible solutions? What are some ideas uh, that then that third party can come in and test and, and look at? and create a financial plan, if you will, for the actual pension problem. Well, good advice, very good <laughs> advice. I hope you're motivated and not too discouraged knowing that it's never too late, right? 
Absolutely. It's never too late. And I want to thank both of you for joining us. I hope you'll come back and, and share thank your you. expertise. We've been talking with Jeannie Fisher and Dr. Indudeep Chachi. Now, speaking of finances, there's going to be a music festival held in Bowling Green in the coming weeks, and the proceeds will help to benefit an iconic venue in the, these parts. Stay with us. Outlook is next. Outlook continues. I'm Barbara Deeb. In the first half of the program, we were talking about finances and your financial fitness. Well, the financial fitness of one of the iconic structures in downtown Bowling Green is questionable at best. Well, some area musicians are getting together to help rectify that situation. Welcome with me, if you will, Ernie Small, who is a musician known to these parts through the Ernie Small Blues Band, Mount Victor Review. And now, at another mantle, you are the coordinator of what's being called the Kentucky Acoustic Music Festival. Right. Yes. Right. Right. Got all that right? That uh, that is that is absolutely right, and and uh, it, it's uh, such a great opportunity for me, I think, to to bring together people that I know through music and and through sponsorship to and uh, hopefully all our friends in the community will come out and support this event because. We have to find ways, I think, to keep this old building vital, viable, you know, as, as an entertainment venue, and it's going to take a lot of money, Barb. More, more than what we're going to get on this one, I'm Well, sure. but it's a start in yes. that regard. Now, if you're not familiar with the Capital Arts Theater in downtown Bowling Green, it is located in the square, and uh, at present, it belongs to SkyPAC? I believe that's correct. Okay, yes. the Southern yeah. Kentucky right. Performing Arts Center, right. Right. which is also one of the sponsors. Yes. This event. Yes. Yes. And so, of course, WKYU PBS through the Lost River Sessions uh, is uh, also a big Good. sponsor, and and uh, we've got several people coming together. Uh, a group, the Haskins Foundations, plus JB Distributors, Mellow Mushroom, uh, Corsair's Distillery, which is pretty much right next door to the Capitol, yeah. is, uh, is going to be kind of a part of the event that night too. Uh, and then uh, Steve and Claudia Downey and, and our friend David Sears and the International Bluegrass uh, Music Museum is also a, a sponsor. Excellent. So I, I think I've got them all. But I, again, a group effort to, uh, to bring people together to recognize the need to support events in this venue. Uh, I, I believe when we talked with uh, Jan at, at Skypack, he would like the money that we raise to go towards l running lights along the aisles in the, in the theater and and there's just so many needs that that building has and uh, um, as I think back about how long I've been here and, and when I first met you back in the early 80s um, it just reopened back then in 1981 and and I, I was trying to think of all the different kinds of shows that and you know things that I've gone and to just see. school and community events uh, that take place so you know this is an important thing to um, to take the step that you did in saying you know I'm a musician this is something I can do to give back so why the capital just because of its history well yes yeah and I and I and I think at least from the way I looked at it is that you know it's a comfortable setting for me it's downtown um, you know, downtown, the downtown area is changing so much when you think about over by the ballpark and things. Uh, and, Hot you know, I'd like to see some of this stay the same and, and, mm -hmm. and be able to value our past. And I'm not being, I'm not from Bowling Green. We talked about that before. But, but I mean, to me, um, my memories are of, of the downtown area and things that have gone down, uh, gone on down there. And, you know, we played concert in the park for, 34 mm, years for a, lot of, a well, long you, time. You know, you were talking and you said it, it needs a lot of work, the mm -hmm. Capital Arts Theater. So this is just a first step. Has anybody taken a look to say it's going to take X amount to do everything we need to do to make this a more viable uh, You know, space? I think th that we did. You know, we talked a ballpark of a couple million dollars. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm sure when, um, you know, not a lot of serious changes. I, I, I read online that you know, in other communities where they have theaters like this that, that you know, they just go in and completely renovate it and, and do a lot of, con you know, a lot of um, construction and change. Mm -hmm. And really not much has changed in the capital from the way where it was as a, a movie theater through the 60s, through the, you know, eight or 50s through the yeah, 80s. Yeah, when you some, walk in there, you feel right. like you're so, so it, you know, it's been used so much. It's got a great art gallery. It's got offices upstairs. It's got, 
um, you know, a lot of nice uh, old old parts to it. And mm -hmm. so architecturally significant. Right. So space. I, you know, but I, I think the roof and you know some of the you know some of the things just where people sit need to be structure. maintained. Right. Yeah. Structure. Right. We're just about out of time now. It's going to be you and the members of Mount Victor Review who yes. will be at the Kentucky Acoustic Music Festival on April 9th. In addition to. Well, we have uh, Bob Bridges and Leslie Mang, who are with the Penny Rylers, okay. and they'll have some guests with them, and we're not exactly sure. And then our friends, and, and old friends of ours, uh, David Romer, Jimmy Raley, Patrick O'Rourke, we've met more recently, and Joel Whittinghill actually are in the Alley Cats. And then uh, in TDH4, uh, our friends, really an old, old friend of, of ours, and I say that because a lot of the musicians a new George Neal who went to Western and we met him in the in the 70s and he was really someone who in, influenced me quite a bit in music and so part of doing this I know this will probably sound odd but I just wanted to bring him back to our community <laughs> because he doesn't come to visit enough and I said if this is what it's going to take I'm just going to have this event I'll just do this event and, and then we'll just bring you back but he plays with a couple gals who have been in the music business for a long time up there. And then uh, Bev and Karen, and then they've got a great bass player who used to play with a group called the Metropolitan Blues All-Stars out of Louisville. And I can't remember his name right now. But, but you'll have to come but, on April 9th to find out. Right, and you will be there as I will our be MC. emceeing the That's event. Right. I'm really right. excited about that. TDH stands for Tall, Dark, and Handsome, by the right. way. Right, and then they it, that, that was the three of them, and then they, they added the four when they added the bass players. There so. you go, TDH4. Ernie Small, musician, coordinator of the Kentucky Acoustic Music Festival. We're going to put up some information as to how you can get tickets through Skypack, and the event is April 9th at 7 p.m. at the Capital Arts Center in Bowling Green. Proceeds to benefit restoration of the Capitol. Ernie, thanks for joining us. Thank you. We'll see you April 9th. All right. Indeed. That's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you joined us.